Hello everyone, my name is Lauren Deeg. I'm an Associate Professor of Urban Planning here at the College of Architecture Planning at Ball State University. This is going to be a series of talks uh, about design culture, design thinking, and design making. Our first talk is called What is Design? its origins, we think about some of the theory, we think about some of the quotes, we think about some of the thinking behind uh, what design is and what design culture brings to us. So we begin with a discussion uh, of what design is to us uh, as individuals and, and how it could be an expression of individuality. A few years ago, uh, I was working with five other uh, colleagues here at the College of Architecture planning six sections and six instructors. and. And we, we decided to conduct a little bit of an experiment just around the conference table uh, before the days of social distancing and remote learning. And uh, I, I conducted this experiment because I could see that we were six very in, unique individuals. We all had a different outlook in terms of what a writing instrument is. And as you can see, uh, with six different people, six different faculty members, we all had very clear uh, uh, different uh, uh, definitions of what a writing instrument was, even though that some of them might have some similarities, but we had six different individual uh, expressions about what a writing instrument or a drawing instrument or a sketching instrument might be. We expanded the experiment and discovered, well, we all had a different maybe definition about what a beverage vessel might be. You can see uh, here the takeout cup from McDonald's. We can see that one of our uh, instructors was from Canada. We have this elegant double-walled uh, uh, porcelain microwavable mug here. We have, a, we have a porcelain or, or ceramic remake of the classic New York cup and our classic steel wall tumbler. So again, six different individual uh, definitions about what a beverage vessel is. As we kept talking, we realized that, that this extended to a lot of other things that, that we use to adorn ourselves. When we, we get up in the morning and we get ready for, for work or for class, we make a series of design decisions every single day. Uh, our, our outward appearance, if you will, is a design decision or a series of design decisions and, and that extended to uh, uh, to jewelry as well. We all had different definitions of what what constitutes a well-designed jewelry and in some cases this was this was traumatic. Uh, in this person's uh, case here, this St. Michael's medal here which is central to uh, that person's faith that he, he said it never had been removed uh, in, in over uh, 40 years of life so so that was uh, became a story unto itself. Our concepts of time uh, in the later 20th century when we all wore watches or analog watches also are extensions of our design thinking, our design values, our design culture. And as you can see, six very different uh, interpretations on what a timepiece means from, from uh, uh, bands that might be made out of rubber or resin uh, to the steel band here to the leather band here or the canvas band in, in this case. Lots of different variations even though uh, all of these different pieces um, uh, have the same function. And so as we look around the world, we see those opportunities to, to make oneself known, to, to, make, uh, to express oneself, to, to stand out in a crowd, if you will. Uh, if, if there's uh, situations which you have that need to stand out, you find that designers really look for those opportunities to stand out from a crowd or to make their mark uh, on society or on the world in interesting ways. And we see that even here in our own community at, in Muncie where uh, we, have, we have some, some interesting urban art uh, that, that constitutes our levee walls and uh, underpasses and things like that. As you travel to other cities like Chicago and New York and San Francisco and Los Angeles, the, the urban art culture is an extension of, of, of a lot of different uh, cultures, whether it be music and fashion or even into architecture and planning. It, it adds great character and uh, uh, great, great vitality in the city. You may have heard the relationship of, of form and function, that we think of design as this relationship or balance between form and function. Louis Sullivan, an architect and engineer of the uh, Chicago firm of Adler and Sullivan, the turn of the century, uh, is, is often quoted with this notion of form following function. His disciple or apprentice, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, had a different uh, uh, definition of uh, the relationship of form and function, uh, and he he saw it, uh, uh, he sought inspiration in nature. He saw that form and function were joined in a union, if you will, in nature, and that this, these relationships between form and function were extremely clear in nature, and that we should look to nature 
to, to, to find more examples of that. Another discussion of form and function, uh, building on our previous one with the timepiece. Uh, these are a series of very functional objects, uh, typically associated with the stirring of coffee or tea, or the, the ability to take uh, solid sugar and, and uh, stir it and have it dissolve into a, into a liquid of some kind. The top one is British. It is made of sterling silver. It fits nicely between the three fingers and uh, even rotates uh, at, at, in the hand and is re infinitely reusable and washable. The, the longer one <laughs> is the American one. Um, this, is, this is made of wood, a uh, renewable resource, but is considerably taller than the others because our coffee drinks in the United States do tend to be larger. In other uh, countries around the world, uh, uh, drinks tend to be anywhere from four to, to maybe six ounces. And here, here we call a, a 12 ounce tall. And uh, we go up from there, as we know. So our coffee stirrers do have to be a little bit larger. But they are made with a resource that is renewable here in the United States. This is the German one. This is the Lufthansa Airlines official coffee stirrer. It kind of almost looks like a piece of structural steel. You can see a top cord, a bottom cord, and a web. Um, I'm using terminology that's used in structural steel. But you can see where the, uh, the stirring end is and where the thumb end is with the Lufthansa logo. And so this is conveniently, this negative space here is conveniently removed to allow the liquid to pass through it as it stirs the sugar. And this is the Italian one. Uh, the, the thumb side is perfectly aligned with the thumb and forefinger, sized perfectly to fit between two fingers. And you can see the agitator side kind of look like, almost looking like a, uh, an egg beater or a, a baking instrument, uh, the agitator side that stirs the sugar. So an interesting and different expression of cultural um, values and cultural ideas across these forms and functions, the British, the American, the German, and the Italian one. Um, you can almost see the coffee stirrers here, or tea stirrers, as an expression of, of, a, of an international culture in form and function. For other examples of that, uh, I go to a German hotel room. This is one of the hotel rooms I stayed in when I was in Stuttgart, Germany. Uh, and this little little uh, diminutive piece that's built into the wall, it took me a, about 10 or 15 minutes to figure out how to turn the lights on. And when, when I discovered that if I put the card key to the hotel room into this as a holder, it, it did several things. It turned the lights on, for one. Uh, it also created an opportunity uh, to solve a problem, um, and that is the issue of always losing your hotel key card. And so this gives a convenient place right in the hotel room to stow the key card so you don't lose it, number one. It also completes the circuit so that all the lights turn on, and it turns all the lights off when the occupant leaves the room, saving energy and solving several problems at the same time. Here's a view of that hotel room. And and sort of some of the efficiencies that are built into it in the sense that closets blend into drawers and create a little shelf uh, for what was a tube television at the time uh, and other efficiencies that are brought together. In a design value that we might argue comes from uh, the architect Ludwig von Mies van der Rohe who said less is more. So this idea of bringing things down to their necessity or to eliminate the unnecessary parts of design our design value that we can think about. This quote I, I enjoy very much. A good design is driven by needs and defined by constraints. When, when we are asked to design something or are tasked with design something, we, we, we certainly want it to look cool, uh, but we also want it to work. But, but uh, we, we understand that, that uh, product design, industrial design, environmental design, is, is driven by a need, uh, the need to solve a problem, and is also guided by a lot of constraints, uh, uh, including cost or size or material or otherwise. So this, as we look at another hotel room, this is the Pod Hotel in, in New York City, where I like to stay often. Uh, a lot of those things have been delivered by constraints, and so instead of building a closet, we can think of a closet uh, for the temporary traveler with a built-in hook and maybe just a few hangers, plus a safe and a shelf. That's probably all a, a New York City traveler needs, uh, given the amount of time that could be spent in the hotel room. Uh, integrating uh, uh, a small desk and luggage storage underneath uh, the bed uh, uh, starts to uh, think about the efficiencies of space. And though that type of thinking uh, of, of eliminating the unnecessary and looking for the efficiencies of space 
is what led to some of our great inventions of the 20th century. This is a, a Lessy typewriter from the 1960s that arguably, I argue, uh, led to the creation or, or the development of laptop computers. And I try to imagine sometimes what would happen if the Lessy had never released the idea of a portable typewriter. Because most typewriters at the time, the 1960s, were things that needed their own furniture and were, were quite heavy and, and massive and needed to be rolled around in offices and required a lot of space. Portability was not part of the equation. When portability became, became a, uh, not a necessity, but, a, but a, a, a constraint or the idea that one could have a portable typewriter, I, I argue that's what has led to a lot of our thinking behind microcomputers. When things are functional, they have a clear function. When they start to take on a different form, they might become playful, might become part, interesting parts of the city. This is the Staatsgalerie in Stuttgart, the city gallery in Stuttgart, Germany. And these are the ventilation uh, uh, shafts that come out of uh, the, the lower archive storage and parts of help ventilate the museum. And they are convenient. Uh, it's a convenient example of saying when you have something that's completely functional, it can, in fact, be playful and, and become a well-designed object in the urban landscape. Another great quote that talks about form and function or the relationship between how something works and how it looks comes from Steve Jobs, the co-founder of Ample. Design is not just what it looks like and feels like. Design is how it works. And I, arguably, this philosophy uh, continues in, into the Apple culture, the entire Apple retail culture, from the design of the products that Apple produces as well as the retail environments in which they sell them. And, uh, and as, as this uh, Fifth Avenue, New York City uh, location of the Apple store uh, probably shows uh, can can become a, a retail destination or a tourist destination by itself. For a good portion of the latter part of the 20th century, early 21st century, uh, many of the Apple stores that you know nationwide and worldwide uh, were designed by the Philadelphia firm of Bolin, Sawinski, and Jackson. And uh, now uh, several of the flagship stores are being designed by Foster and Partners as well as other firms. But the extension of how how it looks but how it works is extended all the way into the interior design and interior architecture of the Apple store itself with some materials and finishes actually resembling that of the product itself. And so a well-designed object, a well-designed product exists and in a well-designed retail environment. And so the extension of the Apple brand into the architecture is, is a new phenomenon, I think, arguably, that we are seeing now in the 21st century. Thinking more about the relationship between form and function, uh, uh, architect and theorist Robert Venturi uh, classified buildings into two categories. One was duck and the other was decorated shed. And his two categories for architecture, uh, one being the duck, this is the famous, world famous, Suffolk County, New York duck. Uh, it's located on Long Island. It is. It remains a tourist attraction since the 1950s. Um, there's different origins on to why this exists, if it was selling duck eggs or, or otherwise, but it is a piece of architecture that is intended to resemble a duck um, and is recognizable from the motor car, from the automobile. So there's this whole uh, category in the United States of roadside architecture of things that are, are intended to be attractive from uh, the windshield or, or from 50 miles per hour. It is a reminder, however, in the back end of the duck that it also has to work. And so there are some functional aspects to the duck, a step, a door, an air conditioning unit, a small window, a light, and, and access to the cellar or basement. Um, the, the duck still has a business end, and it still has to be able to function and work as a building. So those are good reminders that even though uh, we can create interesting and intricate forms, they also still have to work, as Steve Jobs indicated. A quote from Brian Reed, everything is designed... Few things are designed well. Think of all the products and things that you surround yourself with today, and and what and including things uh, that are part of your uh, student office supplies or, or part of your 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 domestic environment or even th objects that you uh, uh, are included part of your clothing. Everything is designed, and uh, but we could argue that few things are designed well. Uh, this is an object from my kitchen. This is a Kitchen Aid uh, can opener. Uh, circa circa mid two thousands, uh, it 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 costs seventeen ninety nine at uh, at our local Kohl's. It is color coordinated with everything else in my kitchen. Uh, it it has the famous KitchenAid logo with a description, if you will. KitchenAid was a 
famous brand, especially for the bakery mixers. They are still sought after, made in the Midwest. It has a couple of holes here for hooks. I don't know who hangs up their kitchen appliances anymore, but that's still there as a way of, of facilitating that kind of necessity. And there's uh, some other features in, uh, built into it, but uh, I've had this piece of equipment for 20 years, and I still can't make it work. I can't get it to actually open a can. So there is, there is a failure there between something that appears well-designed but doesn't function quite right. And so whether it might be my inability to make it work or, or, the, or the product's failure to, to work as, as intended or as designed uh, is, is probably open for discussion. Conversely, the IKEA competitor uh, can opener sells for $3.99 and is about half the size, half, roughly half the weight and actually folds up into itself. This, this arm uh, folds right into the main body here. And again, that, that hole there if you're using a pegboard for your kitchen appliances. But uh, as something that is lighter, uh, cheaper, uh, and easier to use, the IKEA uh, can opener is something that has complemented my, my brick of a KitchenAid uh, can opener. And another thing I really love about all IKEA products is that they come with these wonderful contour drawings that show exactly how to operate the, uh, the, the appliance or the tool itself. IKEA is sold in many, many countries, and so to print out directions in 35 languages would be inefficient. To actually make a diagram or a series of diagrams or drawings using contour line drawing um, is, is much more efficient. And so uh, that's always a nice piece that uh, I look forward to in all IKEA tools. IKEA, of course, is designed in Sweden. Uh, not all the products are made in Sweden, but many of them are designed in Sweden, and so there's a culture in Scandinavia and Northern Europe that we often look to when we come to look at interesting product design or interesting industrial design, as many of those products are designed in Europe. Dieter Rams is a German designer uh, from, from the Wiesbaden, Rhineland area, uh, who, who did a series of objects uh, across the 20th century uh, for a series of houses, uh, raising, uh, ranging from, from uh, the, the, the bronze shaver uh, to uh, to uh, several radios and uh, record players. So, so Dieter Rams has some different uh, tips for designers to think about as they work their way through. We ask some questions as to why something is and why something isn't. So designers, we really, we really want to be asking why something is the way that it is and why not, why something can't be changed. Uh, we are an inquisitive people. We are a um, curious people, and so uh, I, I look forward to those questions uh, in terms of, of asking asking why something is the way it is, and uh, asking if it couldn't be something else. So question everything generally thought to be obvious, uh, Dieter says, as, as part of his advice to designers. And so uh, that leads to some interesting projects and interesting conversations. Here is a wood mock-up for, for someone who asked the question in a Volkswagen factory, perhaps in the mid 20th century Germany. What if we were to build the frame out of a renewable resource as opposed to steel? Uh, what happens when you install swing set in the middle of the High Museum of Art in Atlanta, Georgia? Do, uh, would kids only use it or do adults actually use it as well? What is the concept of play uh, as it relates to public space? And so uh, these questions of why and why not, you know, that notion of, of, of questioning everything that you would think to be obvious. We often associate that kind of thinking with a, a diametric of the growth mindset versus the fixed mindset. Now, this is a psychological pattern and learning styles pattern that uh, has, has, has had some research recently. Those who possess the growth mindset see failure as an opportunity, see challenges as opportunities for growth, uh, see uh, an optimism about, uh, I can learn to do anything I want. Uh, appreciate and, and absorb feedback uh, as, as all being very supportive to the design process. Um, to be inspired by the success of others and having a curiosity of, of learning new things and trying new things. And central to, to that, uh, the, uh, the idea that, that my effort, my attitude determine my abilities. So time, effort, trial and error, and, and getting up and starting over if necessary. If we contrast that with the fixed mindset, I'm either good at it or I'm not, I either can't, can do it or I can't, I don't appreciate challenges, my potential is predetermined, I'm born into something, 
when I'm frustrated, I just give up. Feedback and criticism are personal, and I stick to what I know. This finds itself on the opposite end of the growth mindset. And so I challenge you to think about phrases that you see here, this notion that uh, between the growth and fixed mindset, and kind of assess where you are right now as an incoming CAP student, as an incoming Ball State freshman, and decide very quickly, you know, here, are, are we here to grow, or are, are we already, uh, uh, is, our, is our potential pre-eternal? I would argue that it's not, but I think part of becoming a learner and becoming a designer involves uh, making a decision between the growth mindset and the fixed mindset. This is Maya Bird Murphy. She is a graduate of CAP uh, from a few years ago. She was in uh, my first year studio back in uh, 2002, 2003, maybe a little bit later, uh, but had, a, had an idea, had a, had a why not moment, and, and started asking questions uh, after she left Ball State and pursued her master's degree in Boston uh, of, of how design culture, design thinking, and design making could be more accessible to more people. Uh, as, as an African-American growing up in Oak Park, Illinois, uh, the, the birthplace of Frank Lloyd Wright, and being surrounded by the architecture that's, uh, that's part of Oak Park in Chicago, she started to ask some of the questions of, of, of how design culture and design thinking and design making could be extended to more people. Uh, she observed that, that design culture was kind of an elite club, uh, was kind of a, uh, something that, that one had to, had to uh, rise into. And so uh, the argument that, that uh, extending design culture, design thinking, and this notion of creativity to more people needed to happen. And so she came up with the idea that, well, she knew, she knew that food trucks were quite popular in Boston and Chicago. What would happen if we put um, a, a design thinking or, or maker's studio uh, as a food truck, as a mobile studio, uh, and deployed it to the streets of Chicago? What would that start to look like? What were the mechanics of, of that, just in terms of how one would outfit a food truck or a delivery truck? And what could that do for a neighborhood that maybe didn't have... Uh, conversations about design uh, before, what would that do for a Chicago neighborhood? What would that do for the children in that neighborhood to start to be thinking and designing and making things? She was featured in Dwell Magazine uh, before, uh, just after she acquired the van itself. Uh, this has been a, a, a three-year process since her graduation from the Boston Architectural Center in Boston. Uh, she and her team started to outfit uh, the van itself and started to get it ready. And so that was a process of construction. And now she is doing mobile workshops across the city of Chicago uh, with the youth of Chicago, uh, starting to challenge uh, them in, challenge their creativity, challenge their design thinking ability, challenge their problem solving ability, given, given constraints and, and needs, and starting to uh, 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 hold workshops, even in the, in the time of of uh, social distancing that, that is starting to transform neighborhoods in Chicago itself. There are some photos from her most recent workshop this summer and photos of the van, now three years later, being outfitted uh, and, and branded for, uh, for this purpose. So this is a process that, that Maya started with her master's thesis and is now is, is formed into fruition as a nonprofit organization in the city of Chicago. Another interesting example, this is from Fraser Price in the UK, another why not moment, another well, I wonder what that is moment, another curiosity moment. He just noticed that uh, a lot of the uh, rubbish bins in his neighborhood, his London neighborhood, were had a particular look to how they were labeled. And so he began to photograph them. He began to catalog them in an interesting way and say, you know, I want, this is definitely, someone did this, and so this is someone's mark. And it has a certain character and a certain look to it. And so he started to photograph the, these, these markings on the rubbish bins across his, his part of London or his neighbor, London neighborhood. And he actually made them into a font and it's now available. It's available on the commercial market. And so for those notions of a, of a, of a why not moment or, or knowing that everything is designed, uh, that, that one can celebrate that in an interesting way. And so uh, he is now offering the rubbish font uh, uh, as a commercially available font in the open market. Albert Einstein 
This quote, it's often misquoted at using the word insanity, but I think this the quote, I've done a little bit of research here to try to narrow down the accuracy of the quote, but um, we can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we actually created them. And so uh, this is very, very important for us to, as designers to think about. We are problem solvers, and, uh, and sometimes it requires us to think outside of the box that, that created those problems. Um, and so uh, another example of that, another example of the why not moment, this is the elevated railway known as the High Line that ran through the west side of Manhattan uh, from the 1920s until the 1970s. So it's approximately a mile and a half long. And it's approximately 37 feet above street grade, and it was intended to solve a problem. There were many, many human versus train car collisions uh, at the time. And so elevating the railway through this portion of Manhattan separated the uh, rails, um, rail traffic and freight traffic from the many factories, vertical factories, that are in this part of Manhattan from the street grade as a point of safety, as a way of solving a problem. But uh, having, having hosted its last train in the 1970s, has been largely uh, ignored from since the 1970s, and so nature starts to take over. And as a point of why not, uh, the neighbors who live in this part of neighborhood called uh, this part of Manhattan, from the Meatpacking District all the way through Chelsea, uh, this portion of Western Manhattan going up into Hell's Kitchen and Midtown, started to ask the question: What if this was a linear park? Why not? Uh, rather than tearing down the elevated railway, what if we started to embrace the fact that nature has already started to take over this rail bed and, uh, and celebrate it as a linear park. And so uh, that required a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of questioning, a lot of meetings, uh, and a design competition to start to open up some ideas for what the High Line might start to look like. And approximately uh, here 10 years later, 12 years later, uh, the High Line is one of the number one tourist attractions in the Manhattan itself, over a million people visited each year with its collection of outdoor sculpture, uh, social spaces, and interfaces with existing historic buildings, warehouse, former warehouse buildings, as well as the new architecture uh, being built uh, as we speak uh, at, at the northern end of the High Line and Hudson Yards neighborhood. So um, again, that question, that question of questioning everything, but also asking why not? Why not start to think about this uh, existing piece of infrastructure and find a new use for it. It's something that uh, I've been able to catalog and visit uh, over, over my uh, past few years visiting New York and seeing the new developments that have happened. The, the High Line terminates in a new portion of New York called the Hudson Yards. This is a rail deck, if you will. This is a deck built on top of the Long Island Railroad that feeds into uh, Penn Station. And so these are projects that help uh, form the northern terminus of the High Line. This is called the Vessel by by architect Thomas Heatherwick, and this is called The Shed. This is a performing arts venue by uh, Diller Scafidio and Renfro. Charles Mingus was a jazz musician. Now, Charles Mingus would, was, was perhaps not a designer as we consider a designer to be, but uh, I think Charles Mingus uh, inhabits a lot of what I cherish as creative thinking and design thinking. Jazz musicians uh, agree on a common theme, agree on a common rhythm, and then improvise uh, around that theme and in and out of that rhythm. Uh, and so I, I argue that jazz music, if you will, is, is an is a incredible expression of creativity and design thinking. Making the simple complicated is common. Making the complicated simple awesomely simple, that's creativity. I think Dieter Rams would agree with that. Uh, his aim is to omit everything superfluous so that the essential is shown to the best possible advantage. And then the objects and products that Dieter uh, designed and produced for um, the many design houses of, of Europe, that, that certainly is, is the case. If we look at a couple of functional objects that we have from our everyday, we see that they are designed. We see that they have structure. We see that they have a buildup of material and a web of material. Some might even have cross reinforcement or otherwise, but what happens to all of this when this sits in a landfill for two to three hundred years is probably something we don't want to contemplate, especially now that we are using so much disposable flatware in the time of social distancing. And so folks, folks are thinking about renewable resources and how they could start to address a renewable resources like bamboo 
uh, to create a combination spoon fork that you could pack directly into your into your lunch or include in a takeout um, situation. And so that this makes uh, food more portable, as we know, um, as many of our lives are, are either dominated by self-cooked food or uh, by takeout food, this, this type of thing might, might help to reduce the amount of waste that, uh, that flatware creates uh, when, when single-use plastic is, is introduced into the waste stream. Single-use plastic, as we know, will be a situation that we will be dealing with for the next two to three hundred years. Other objects that are kind of in that fashion, here's a combination uh, grooming brush and, and, uh, and uh, clothes hangers. So the idea that if you're traveling and you have formal uh, business wear, whatever that is anymore, uh, that this single object could, could work as both a brush to brush off the dust or, or the lint from your clothing and, and hang it up in a convenient situation, even if that happens to be a moving train. Another quote from Dieter, good design is making something intelligible and memorable. Great design not just good, but great design is making something memorable and meaningful. And so we look for those opportunities. You know, when is a staircase something so much more than a functional staircase? When is that something a memorable and meaningful experience for somebody as opposed to just a functional experience? When can a, a cluster of seating uh, pods or chairs or, or lounges or leaning benches or stools be gathered together into something that's memorable and meaningful. This is at the Design Museum in Munich, Germany. When can a particular species of shrub be chosen so that it blooms uh, bright red at one point in the year and have that park become a memorable and meaningful experience for all who visit it? And we, we think about social distancing today and how important our open spaces and parks are. That When can we choose uh, components, materials, or even plants to make something a memorable and meaningful experience at, at one or more times of the year. The author of The Little Prince, Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, gives us another quote from design. A designer knows that they have achieved perfection, not when there is nothing left to add, but when there is nothing left to take away. This is consistent with our other quotes, I would argue, so far. Uh, quotes from Dieter, quotes from Steve Jobs. Um, that notion of when, you've, when you know the design is done or design has achieved equilibrium or perfection or an acceptable outcome when there's nothing left to take away. Not when there's nothing left to add, but when there's nothing left to take away. When you've achieved a, when the design has achieved its, its goals or its aims or its mission. That goes all the way into design communication as well or drawing. Uh, this plan for central Philadelphia is, is taken away. A lot of the unnecessary information is focused on the intended development, the intended uh, revitalization of streets, the intended addition of housing and office, the intended notion of, of reorienting uh, central Philadelphia around its waterfront. And so, so we apply this thinking, this idea of, of when there's nothing left to take away, when, when, when there's nothing left to add versus nothing left to take away to our, our design communication as well. When is the diagram, when is the drawing uh, communicating everything it needs to do without a lot of access? If you look at that same view of Philadelphia today, you can see there's a lot more information to that and that the drawing is actually helping us focus on some key tactics, open space, infill development, landmarks, and streets and axes that help us to reconnect to the Philadelphia riverfront. Well, well, with, while leading, leaving out a lot of the unnecessary information. So that, that, that argument of, of when there's nothing left to add versus nothing to take away applies all the way down to design drawing and design communication, as well as city planning and landscape architecture. Arguably, design is a process. It is not something that happens instantly. It's not something that happens in a vacuum. And so uh, as we look at some of the great projects or landmarks of our time. This is an exhibit of all of the study models that went into the Beijing Olympic Stadium. This was a room full of models um, for one project. And they ranged from size, from something you could hold in your hand here with these smaller study models made out of foam and out of polystyrene, just of the stadium roof itself, to something that sits on a tabletop in which we can actually start to 
uh, put little little scale figures, ranging all the way to one huge mock-up of one of the steel members uh, uh, that that started to to uh, accentuate the web of structure that became uh, the Beijing Olympic Stadium, uh, affectionately known as the Bird's Nest. And so this room uh, at one of the uh, museums in Munich. Uh, tried to chronicle every single physical model that went into this design process of this very one building. And so an entire room of models, entire room of objects showing that process of do it over, make it again, do it again, do over, no, fail, ah, try it again, try something else, is a chronicle of this particular firm's design process for that single building. Charles and Ray Eames were a husband and wife collaboration team. They designed a lot of things from whole buildings to interiors uh, to films to furniture. Uh, we have a couple of their objects in the Ball State Museum of Art collection. The details are not the details. The details make the design. So that relationship between a detailed decision and a design decision, whether it be a paint color or how two materials meet, uh, end up making the design. Uh, our automobile designers and manufacturers probably knew that pretty well uh, because every single decision that went into the making of a car uh, has an effect on everything else in that, uh, that car, from how, how the car performs to how it's ventilated to how much it weighs. So all of those different details that go into uh, making a car um, have a relationship to how that car, car performs, whether it's fuel efficient or not or whether it's fast or not or otherwise. It's a very complex organism when all those design decisions start to come together, when all those details start to come together. And so the, when the details make the design, those decisions, the material decisions or those joinery decisions or how materials meet, they, when they make the design, they have the ability to make something memorable and meaningful. This is a common street sign in Europe, and I often giggle at when I see one of these. And I often wonder, at remember how I wondered what this meant. And, if it meant this way to the red hammers, or what, what exactly it would mean. It actually is the symbol for a dead-end street. So uh, here in the United States, we spell out the words dead-end as if it were some sort of existential crisis. Uh, but in Europe, where you have a lot of different languages uh, inhabiting the landscape, uh, pictorial symbols are used instead to help communicate an idea. And you start to think about it. You look at that and go, oh, okay, so this might be the path of the street and here is the path ending abruptly. So this is in fact a planned view diagram of the city street itself. Uh, and that is somehow, perhaps, hopefully, recognized by folks who might not speak the same language. Another example of the why not here is, here is a foosball table designed and built with uh, replicas of salad dressings. So we have the dairy-based dressings against the vinegar-based dressings. We'll see who will win after three rounds. Here is a playground in Atlanta, Georgia, designed uh, by Izamu Noguchi. Izamu Noguchi was a sculptor who spent some of his time, actually, some of his uh, middle school and high school years in Elkhart, Indiana. So Noguchi has Indiana, some Indiana roots. Um, and is another expression, if you will, of, of those that relationship between form and function around a very popular playground in Atlanta. Uh, this is... This is a, a series of playground objects and playground equipment that, uh, that he collaborated with, I believe it was Herman Miller or Knoll Design Studio, and uh, uh, intended to produce them widely, but uh, I believe this is one of the only examples of that. Fun fact, uh, the author of your two textbooks is right there. That's Frank Cheng. Uh, that's, there he is in the flesh. So, so if, if you're putting a name to the face or a face to the name, uh, you, the author of your two textbooks, Francis D.K. Cheng, there he is right there standing underneath the, the famous Noguchi slide. Engaging the senses. Uh, too often we think of design as only being a visual language. And while many of our, our efforts are visual in our, in our communication of design intention and, uh, and in the making of things that, that appeal to the visual sense, great design engages all of the senses. So the, that notion of when we can be open to more experiences. When that notion, when uh, when a water fountain can 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 accommodate our human friends, but also also accommodate our four-legged friends. That that notion of where we can serve more than one species at one time, and that that the little details that go into a, a drinking fountain like this for our dog our dog friends here, 
can also be memorable and meaningful. So, so these examples here that, that at the end of the show hopefully are remarking some of our previous quotes and previous ideas about what design is. That, that uh, details make the design, that uh, this great design can be memorable and meaningful. Uh, and that it can reflect uh, more than one species and, and reflect more all the senses. When we think about food and we think about beverage, we, we do engage more than one sense. We have a visual sense. We have an olfactory sense or the sense of smell. We have uh, the sense of touch, which uh, allows us to interact with the objects. We also have the sense of taste. So the, the ability to, to, to articulate multiple senses into the experience of this cup of coffee probably makes this cup of coffee more memorable and meaningful than other cups of coffee I've had. Ironically, this is, this is a very simple cup of coffee at a, at a train station in Belgium. Uh, but the attention to detail and the attention to quality and the attention uh, given to the presentation of everything on this, on this tray uh, make that cup of coffee much more memorable and meaningful than other cups of coffee that perhaps I may have had. We can take that thinking and extend it into the environment. As you, as you well know, you're a gener you are a generation that, that knows their coffee houses well, that, that frequents coffee houses uh, because they are accessible to multiple ages. And so the design of the environment in which you drink coffee is, is perhaps just as, as important as the coffee itself. The objects in which the coffee is served can be an extension of the five senses or an extension of design thinking. Uh, how a cup fits in the hand, how it's presented uh, uh, by the server itself. And so as we start to extend that thinking into environmental design, can we design spaces and places uh, for multiple generations, multiple populations, multiple species, and with folks of multiple abilities. This is a still from the sensory garden or the enabling garden at the Chicago Botanic Garden, which is designed around disability, which is designed around limited ability. And so can you design places for folks who might be sight impaired or hearing impaired? Uh, those kinds of questions. And so we we, we, as we know, we love water and we love our fountains here at Ball State. Uh, can, can those also extend to multiple populations, multiple ages, multiple species, or, uh, or multiple abilities? Can we look at nature in a new way and start to appreciate uh, design around us and, and even the smallest details uh, that, that, that allow these different species to thrive? Can we extend that? Can we take inspiration from all of that and start to make more meaningful places, more memorable spaces for all of us to enjoy. Uh, I think we can learn a lot from, from design culture and a lot from nature as we start to apply and, and, and think about how our projects start to shape the greater world. In our time, design is a necessary responsibility. The value and especially the legitimization of design will be in the future measured more in terms of how it can enable us to survive on this planet. And so as we consider the problem of climate change and we consider how our decisions affect others, it is imperative that we as emerging designers have an empathy, not only for the earth, but also for each other. And arguably this image is quite powerful in terms of how we are stewards of the earth, but I think we could also argue that the earth takes care of us more than we take care of it, at least at this moment. This is a composite image, an artistic impression, if you will, artistic composite image of all of the fires that happened just on the continent of Australia over the course of one year, between, between spring 2019 and spring 2020. And so while this image is somewhat deceptive in that it is a, a timeline, if you will, of all of the fires that happened, it is a reminder that climate change is affecting different parts of the world in dramatic and sometimes frightening ways with great destruction to property and great destruction to wildlife. Uh, it is, it, the Australians are still estimating how many billions of animals were lost uh, to, the, to these incessant wildfires that, that struck the continent uh, between 2019 and 2020, two of the warmest years on record, as you all know. Design can start to address these problems. Uh, we have examples uh, such as the Phipps Center in Pittsburgh, which is, has been certified LEED Platinum. Platinum is the highest award available. And while we are looking at other systems 
uh, competing systems for lead uh, across the world and starting to think about net zero or net positive energy used for a building. Uh, examples like the Phipps Conservatory are examples in which a building does contribute uh, more energy than it uses and, and cleans more water than it soils. So um, we do have examples that we can study uh, uh, across our, our landscape that, that lead us to a better, better place. Thoreau, the transcendentalist uh, philosopher, it's not what you look at that matters, it's what you see. So design starts to ask us to see things a little bit differently. When is a toasted ham and cheese sandwich something so much better than a regular toasted ham and cheese sandwich? When can we apply design thinking and design values to, to making something extraordinary, to seize the day or carpe diem, if you will, to make some, something ordinary extraordinary? When can we start to look at our context here at CAP and at Ball State in special ways? It's, it's, a, it's a matter of patience when all the fall colors start to come together and reveal to us all, all the great variety that we have in nature. But, that, but then that we can extend some of that thinking to our home, hometown, and appreciate the beauty and uh, uniqueness uh, of, of every part of the landscape. When can we apply that thinking to where we are and where we study right here at CAP and start to appreciate the details and the beauty and the design decisions that went into uh, everything that's led into our everyday life. And most importantly, when can we start to explore uh, the different natural and urban environments and, uh, and start to interact with them in new and interesting ways as a group, as we start to develop our design thinking, our design culture, and start to form community and build community here at CAP, uh, how, can, how can we make our community and our little slice of the earth a better place. Thank you very much.